about 1974, we were, uh, Rick and I were in the process of kind of preparing for an album on Polydor Records. We'd been kind of searching for a label and all that. So we were writing songs and, and recording when we could. Uh, and we were actually based out of Los Angeles in those days. And uh, we came up with a song. It was sort of about the mythical, and I'm not sure whether it's an Aesop's fable or whatever, but the mythical magical boots you can put on to cross oceans and mountains to find your true love, to find true love. I don't know whether we just made that up one night or, yeah, it's an ancient tale, that's it. Uh, but uh, uh, so Seven League Boots was the title of this song that uh, we recorded uh, out at Sound City uh, when we first got to know Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham and their engineer Richard Dashett. Um, they were, this was during the Buckingham Nicks period and Buckingham Nicks had just been thrown off Polydor and why we don't, we'll never know, but Polydor just didn't know what to do with a group like Buckingham Nicks. Um, they had a song called Monday Morning on their album a song called Landslide on their album that uh, became monster hits for not only Fleetwood Mac, but for uh, other people as well. So, um, so anyway, back to, uh, to uh, Seven League Boots. Uh, we cut the song at Sound City and made a really nice recording of it with the Curtis Brothers uh, singing it. And Stevie and Patty and I did the background vocals. So on the demo, Stevie Nicks is on it. And Tom's playing the solo on it. And we, when we finally made the Polydor album, we did not include it for unbeknownst reasons. I don't really remember why not. And I remember when we had the album playing party, there were a lot of people there. And there was a friend of Lindsay's, one of these really rich, uh, cocaine-y people, you know, with a $5,000 suit. And, all that and he was like poking me in the chest saying you guys are nuts you should have put that song on the album and I go no we're not nuts you know it, it didn't belong there you know so it was one of those things everybody in LA has an opinion and this guy had his of course he also had all the all the blow too so I guess <laughs> um, that's probably why he was at the party um, so uh, but I never had met him before so I don't know who he was really but still uh, that kind of impressed me that this guy thought, you know, we were stupid not to put that song on the, on the Polydor album. Um, however, the story, uh, the plot thickens. So uh, about five or six years later, um, Stephen Stills was on tour with Crosby, Stills & Nash in Europe. And uh, our good friend and publisher, Ken Weiss, was uh, um, kind of hanging with Stephen and driving him around. They rented a great big gigantic Mercedes and... Uh, kind of split off from the tour bus group and we're going through the Alps and Kenny had a tape of some Curtis Brothers songs and was just playing, you know, this cassette in the car with Stephen. And Stephen heard Seven League Boots and inquired, what the heck is that? You know, I really like that. Uh, he says, uh, ask him if I can, you know, play with that, you know. So since it was kind of a throwaway song for us, we said, sure, you know. And once he got back, he said, yeah, Stephen was interested in this. And we said, yeah, sure, go ahead. We're not doing anything with it. So he, in turn, um, had, at that point in his life, he had just gotten divorced from uh, this French singer, his wife, uh, Veronique Sanson, and was all depressed and hanging around L.A. and, and not being productive. And uh, a couple of his buddies came to him and said, you know, you need to get out of town. So you need to come sailing with us. So they jump on a, a masted ship of some sort and sail down into the South Pacific. And when he gets back, he's got these lyrics that he's not quite sure what to do with. He puts the two and two together, and uh, therefore all the sailing jargon in the song, um, and uh, pretty much puts the song together. Now, he cuts it for an album on Columbia that... Uh, had you know Bonnie Bramlett and a bunch of different people. It was kind of a mismatch of different kinds of tunes and no real center theme kind of a thing. It was just Stephen Still songs and 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 Southern. It was called Southern Cross, and uh, that was on that record. But that record never got released, and uh, for reasons, for whatever reason, and uh, 
Stephen uh, got together with Graham and David and started working on an album called Daylight Again. That album and ended up having uh, Southern Cross on it. And it was interesting because the song was so long that they were trying to make it a single. The first single off the album was uh, Wasted on the Way. And uh, they were trying to make Southern Cross a single and we're going through all these different mixing things, cutting, editing here, trying to take this out. And and uh, I remember Stanley Johnson telling me that one day everybody said, ah, oh, we're not sure what we're going to do with this, but it's too long. Nobody will play it. So everybody went to lunch and Stanley said, I just went over and just went, well, look, just fade it right here. And when they got back from lunch, he played them the, the fade that he had done. And they all just said, that's it, that's it. So that became the second single. I think I went to like 18 on the charts that year it's like November of 82 something like that and you know you never know about a song whether it's going to be a classic or get a lot of airplay or not and you just never know because Crosby Stills and Nash have had a lot of songs that came out and sounded good but don't get the kind of rotation airplay that Southern Cross Wasted on the Way Carry On some of those songs so uh Anyway, that was history until uh, the 90s when Jimmy Buffett cut the song. I got a call from uh, somebody one night late, and they were at a concert in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they said, Curtis, you're never going to believe this. And he holds up his phone, and I'm hearing Southern Cross on the other end. I go, well, what's that? He says, I'm into, at a Jim, Jimmy Buffett concert. And Buffett, I guess in his shows, would do all his own material except for three songs. And Brown Eyed Girl was one of the songs that they would do that were not Jimmy Buffett songs. And apparently he replaced Brown Eyed Girl with Southern Cross and and uh, actually put it on a live album called Wednesdays, no, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, which is what their tour schedule is. And if you've ever been out for three months at a time, you do four or five days in a row and you're exhausted and you get a day off in some, some little town in a Holiday Inn somewhere along the side of a highway, you know, sometimes. So it's not always a pretty life. But uh, So when you're doing uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, that's a really nice, easy tour schedule. And, and uh, of course, Buffett can pull that off. So anyway, uh, that's the story of Southern Cross, and I guess I'm going to have to stick to it. So. <laughs>